make her son like a man again. So it was just like something we touched on a little bit. Yeah, and that's another um, one of those contested claims. Right? So I, I'm glad you guys um, you brought that up because you kind of get into um, this notion of the counter argument, the argument. Um, so let me jump into my notes. Um, so we know this article or this reading is also coming from um, uh, Dr. Nana Lawson Bush and his brother Edward Bush. Um, so just to start off with, right, it starts off with a question. How does a boy become a man, right? So this is the question. And so before I get into my notes, I want to kind of deal with this idea or this notion of a question. I, I mentioned it earlier um, in the day. So there's, there's multiple ways, and, and we'll stick to three, three ways to think about a question, right? Um, the first one being, I read this article, I don't understand this article, now I have a question, right? That's a very straightforward type of question. The second way of, of thinking about a question is, um, I read this article, it's making me think about something or it's producing a question in my mind. Now I'm gonna go research what I'm thinking about, right? I'm gonna go try to find an answer to that question, right? So it's the second way to think about a question. The third way, and for me, the most fecund way or the most um, giving of life way, that's what fecund means, is um, what we see here in the article. How does a boy become a man, right? That's the question. And now what the author is doing is producing an article that's gonna answer that question, right? So this is a question that's producing production or producing written work, right? So this whole article is gonna be dedicated to answering the question, how does a boy become a man, right? If I'm gonna take it and make it personal, for my dissertation, the question that I have is, what is the ideal pedagogy? What is the ideal teaching format for all African people globally, right? So I'm coming up with a pan-African pedagogy. But that question, what is the ideal pedagogy for African people is what's driving my work. And all the books that I read and all the research that I do are intended to answer that one fundamental question. So again, there's three types of question. One, I've read this, I don't understand this. I have a question. Two, I've read this, this is making me think about something at a deeper level. I'm gonna go research that or gonna go look this up. And or three, which is really what I want you guys to get, get, get at as um, intellectuals and scholars. This is the question that I seek to answer by writing this paper, or this is the, the, the paper that the question that will be answered in this paper is such. Do you understand what I mean by these questions and the different iterations of questions? If you need me to clarify, please, I, I, I want to make sure you guys get this. Because really, when you get to like, um, even ma master's level work, and you get to writing a paper, a good educator, right? A, a good teacher, a good mentor is gonna ask you, well, what's the question that's driving that paper? And you need to be able to think about things in terms of paper, in terms of questions, excuse me. Um, also, right, think about our journal. What's the four components of our journal? The thesis, the analysis, the contemporary analysis, and the question. That's why I have you place the first, the fourth component as a question. I want those questions to evolve into, I'm gonna write a paper about this question. So towards the end of your journal, you should be starting to ask questions that will allow you to produce a paper, right? And drop a little nugget, right? When it, I believe we have a paper due in this class. Um, that paper that will be due in our class should come from a question that's written in your journal, right? So I'm, I'm literally like setting you up to write this paper. But these questions become paramountly uh, of paramount importance, right? In fact, when I read your paper, I'm going to ask you, what's the question that's driving your paper? When you produce an abstract for me, I'm going to ask you, what question are you seeking to answer? So I, I, it's very important that you understand the distinctions between the iterations of questions. Is everybody on board with me on that? Okay. Um, so it says that scholars historically and more recently argue Black men have been collectively emasculated because of these um, factors. But um, one of them being enslavement, it caused a situation where Black men could not protect themselves or their families. The second one being a matriarchal system within the Black communities caused by an absent father or an overpowering Black women. Um, but this is important, right? Within the context of a patriarchal US society that expects the men to be the head of the household. Right, so it's very important that um, the matriarchal system only emasculates the black man 
when he's operating through the context of a patriarchal US society, right? So when they're buying into what Western thinking says is a man, then the black man feels emasculated by these matriarchal systems within the household. Does that make sense? So if you think back to last week's article and they talk about how black boys distinguish themselves and how they articulate what masculinity is, right? It's vastly different from how the dominant, i.e. white European culture articulates what manhood is. So what he's saying, what they're saying in this article is that the only way that black men feel emasculated by a matriarchal or a powerful woman is when he's operating under the paradigm or under the understanding of manhood based off of what Euro-American um, definitions of manhood is. Do you understand that distinction? Okay. Um, the third one is economic oppression um, that rem renders black men unable to provide for their families, right? And then here we go with a counter argument and we get into, um, as it pertains to enslavement, right? Because they say that enslavement was one of the factors that emasculates black men. So Bell Hooks, um, who recently transitioned to an ancestor, so may she rest in power. Um, Hooks argues African men were not socialized to see themselves as protectors of all African women, right? But the specific, but only the women from their specific group or their family, right? So if we're on a plantation, um, I'm from the Akan tribe, right? Someone else is from the um, Yoruba tribe. I don't have a sense of responsibility for that person because that's not my tribe. That's not my family. My responsibility is for my tribe and for my family. So when I'm thinking about how a woman to liberate, I'm thinking about the woman who I'm married to from my ethnic group, right? I'm not too much concerned with this other sister because she's not from my background, right? So this is what Bell Hooks is arguing as to why enslavement was not a process of emasculating the black men because he didn't feel that responsibility towards all black women on the plantation, right? But which is also counter argued in the article, okay? Um, now this asks this idea of the impact of the matriarchal um, family structure on the black man, right? So it says the impact of matriarchal um, the matriarchy, excuse me, on the black manhood is one, the absence of the black father and the presence of the exceptionally powerful black woman calls a situation that stifles black boys ability to be men as a man must teach a boy to be a man, right? And, and again, this becomes um, critiqued and questioned because going back to the work of those like Bell Hooks, right, who are from this black feminist um, theology or not theology, ideology, excuse me, they argue that no, it's not the um, presence of this overpowering black woman that, that emasculates black men, right? It's these racist structures that depict manhood in this very myopic way that is causing the emasculation of the black men. So it's not the women's fault, right? What the women are doing is they're stepping up to fill the void that's being left because of these racist institutions. Right. So if, if no one's going to be a leader of the household, we're just not have a leader of the household. No, the woman's going to step up and fulfill her role. Right. So what Bill Hooks is saying is the woman's stepping up to, to fill that void is not the issue. The issue is the systems that cause the void in the first place. Right. Prison industrial complex. Um, the war on drugs, which leads to the prison industrial complex. Right. We talked about the welfare system and. and, and um, and, and subsidized housing, how you had to have a, a man removed from the household to receive those benefits, right? So Bell Hooks is talking about those structural issues that would remove the man from the household. And that's the problem, right? So again, these are contested ideas, okay? Um, also economic oppression deprives black males of their manhood. Um, going back to what I was just saying, black feminist liter literature claim racist scholarship creates the myth of the black woman causing division within the black families, right? Never has been, it's never has been the existence of a, um, and then one of the claims also is that there has never been existence of a matriarchal system within the United States, right? Because women have no power to really establish these matriarchal systems. So again, we're seeing contested information, right? So one is saying that, um, well, it's these overpowering women that's causing these black men to be emasculated. And we have these feminist thinkers, black feminist thinkers who are saying, nah, nah, it's more systemic, right? Um, it's these ideas that are promulgated by whiteness that are causing um, black men to feel uh, insecure with their manhood, right? 
And this idea of a matriarchal system cannot be the case because where in the United States do women hold supreme power over manhood? Bell Hooks argues that there's that cannot be found, right? Um, then he moves through a scholar by the last name of Watts, right? And, and what Watts is able to do is he's using how activists and how African people within the community are articulating what manhood is, right? So he's looking at that source of information. And then he's looking at these black scholars in the academy who are concerned with the, the um, how manhood is being performed, right? And what he founds is the people in the community and the people in the um, in activists, right, are in alignment with the black scholars and how they view manhood, which is drastically opposed to how these white interpretations of manhood is viewed, right? So that, that distinction that's being drawn in the last article is being picked up again here, okay? Um, and I'll end with Karanga. Um, Karanga is the creator of Kwanzaa. He's also the chair of the Cal State Long Beach um, Africana Studies Department. Really, really brilliant scholar. He has a really dope book on um, Ma'at, if, if you want to um, get deeper into Ma'at. But Karanga asserts, right? And this is again, if you think about last week's article and we think about how the distinctions and how African men define manhood, right? They talk about that there is the um, feminine principle and the masculine principle in both men and women, right? So think about that and we listen as we listen to Karanga. He says, Karanga asserts that the woman and the man's role is the same, right? shared responsibility in love and struggle, right? So it's no different, right? What the call for black men and for black women is, is to get, is to love each other and struggle together, right? Then he posits seven core qualities um, to be knowledgeable, to be principled, to be committed, to be disciplined, to be achievement oriented and to be audacious, right? And this is not applied to just men, this is not applied to just women, this is applied to both, right? And then it says, uh, um, and then he, he goes into this idea working through the Million Man March and some of the critiques of the Million Man March that women weren't involved in that process, right? And he argues that events like the Million Man March, events, um, programs like all male rites of passage, um, schools that are strictly dedicated to black men, those are only okay. Those are only okay when you apply the same amount of energy and effort to erecting edifices for black women, right? That that energy is equitable in the way that it's being disseminated. And we're not only paying attention to our black boys, but we're giving equal and um, you know appropriate attention also to our black girls, right? Um, so I'll end my notes there and we'll transition to our fishbowl. Does anyone want to volunteer for fishbowl? So we got Tanaya. Um, me. Um, okay, hold on. We got Jennifer, Tanaya, Roxana, and Anna. So those, those will be the four. Give me one moment, y'all. Jennifer, Roxana, and there was one more. I'm sorry, I'm missing one. It was Jennifer, Tanaya, Roxana, and okay, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Okay, so whoever is ready or whoever wants to start, it's on you. Uh, I'll, guess I'll go first. Um, I know we're talking about a lot about the um, absent father and stuff. So something that stuck out to me was like going back to what my peers said about like the whole like idea of having an absent father and like it being an internal boy. It kind of reminds me of, um, I don't know if you guys took Professor Vines with um for the Weber Queen class, we kind of watched a movie called, um, what is it called? Claudette. Claudine, it's like Claudette. a 70s movie. Yep. Yeah, um, I don't know, it just took me back to like watching that and like how you said about like the whole, um, like the rent and like how it's so ridiculous and all this, it's, you know, like the whole movie touches on a rebel, being like a rebel and stuff, like having no um, father figure, having, you know, like her his mother is a, head of household kind of dynamic. So, yeah. So what, what I want to just real quick, I'll make it real quick. Um, so what Jennifer just offered us, right, is an analysis. So I, I read this, 
And I'm thinking about a movie that I watched in another class called Claudine, which is, is really a, a perfect understand, way to understand what is being discussed within the film. Um, so this is what I'm talking about when I mean an analysis. You're able to reach, um, reach from outside sources to allow you to make a deeper um, understanding of what you engaged in, in, this, in this course. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, who's next? Um, just to touch on that one more time, I remember it also saying like the goal of like the white supremacists was that it, um, an idea to make a black man look weak. So because they were eternal boys or because there was an idea of that, it gave them another reason to call our black men weak. Yep, and that's pulled from the article. So thank you, Zoe. Mm -hmm. Who's next? Yeah. We have Tanaya, uh, Roxana, and Otto. I'll go next. Okay. Um, the in the article, I thought it was interesting how in the part where they talk about um, slavery effects on manhood, how they said like in the Western um, idea of man being a man, you have to be like um, you have to be like a leader, and you have to um, like you know show that you're responsible but then at the same time the people who did that were like isolated and killed and I thought like I don't know it made me think about growing up um, my because my grandfather's from the south and he would always say like um if you see a police don't pay too much attention or um if you ever get pulled over be like don't do anything just be still like don't move like don't like do anything and it, I don't know from from the idea maybe like growing up in the South, it was more like of an effect on him growing up that you had to be, you know, you couldn't be too out, like be bold or be um, outspoken. You had to be quiet and you had to watch, like be step off, like, I don't know. Yeah. Like you had to be very cautious. Yeah. That's the word I want, very cautious. Yeah. And I and growing up here in California, I never really had that same idea. But also my grandmother is from California. Even back then in those like in the 50s or the 40s, she didn't have the same experiences my grandfather did in, in Texas. So there are concepts of, you know, um being outspoken and stuff like that are very, very different. Mm -hmm. So but yeah, that part, I just thought that was very interesting. Yeah, um, you bring up some really good points. Autumn, I, I, got, I got a story for you um, we'll get to at the end. And also, we'll talk a little bit about the Great Migration as it pertains to why Cali folks are a little bit different. Um, who's next? Okay. I could go next. So kind of like following along what um, my classmate was saying, I also wrote down in my notes that I feel like overall, like I feel like back then, like especially black men weren't able to like stand up for themselves. And if they did, I know there was a part that, that said that they were isolated or killed. And just because it wanted to be who they wanted to be, right? And another one that caught my attention was the table on our readings where it had the different stereotypes. So I found it really interesting because I went through it. I read both like the woman and the men's side. And I kind of like, when I read, I relate to what is going on in the world right now. So some of them were like, wow, like I wonder if this is still going on or like people think about this um, the way they do with those stereotypes that were shared in the reading. So I thought that that was really like interesting to read, read it from like back then to read it from now. It's just um, crazy to see that there's some stereotypes that still happen. So, yeah. Yeah, so for me, um, what Roxanne is demonstrating, right, is the contemporary analysis. So we had we had Jennifer give us an analysis, right, from a from a which is still like an old source, right, because the movie is from the seventies. Um, but but way that Roxana was thinking about it, like automatically, boom. So how do these stereotypes fit to what's going on in our twenty twenty two, right? So this is the um, third component of our journal. So I, I'm glad to hear you practicing it and working through what is being assigned to the journal and making it work for you in real time. So great, uh, tonight. Honestly, um, while you were reading from your notes, I started to draw connections to my other Pan-African Studies course that I'm taking this semester. Um, it's based around the psychology of African people, African-American people. Who's teaching the class tonight? Um, I don't want to mess up his name. Let me go to my 
Jerry McDougal, maybe? Yes. Okay. So uh, recently in one of our, I believe it was the last uh, classroom meeting, actually, we were talking about racial identity. And I had posed the question, because we were also talking about how like hypercritical Black people can be to other Black people. And when we were talking about like the, the look that some Black men have or like how Black women who leave their homes are labeled as like overly masculine in a sense and black men who aren't the head of the homes or aren't masculine enough. Mm -hmm. I think back to what we were talking about and I was just like, is the toxicity, the things that are labeled toxic within black households actually like toxic behaviors or is it passed down generational trauma that we've yet to be able to actually recognize and understand because like even in that class I still have a hard time trying to wrap my head around it because it's kind of like we are hypercritical of each other and it could be for the smallest things like you go to someone's house and maybe they didn't have time to get up a pile of trash and that's the only thing someone will talk about the whole house can be spotless and that one pile of trash and the next thing you know all the cousins and family members her house is dirty this and that you know and the house isn't dirty there was just a pile of trash so that's really what like it made me think about because realistically when black men are masculine or fit masculine characteristics they're given this link, this label of being dangerous and being like, uh, what's the word? What's the word? Like they see people fear when they are at their peak of masculinity because they feel like, oh, they're dangerous. They're not. When in actuality, that's just masculinity of a black man. He's not there. The intention isn't to hurt anyone by being themselves. But I think that because throughout history they've been trying to suppress the masculine black man when uh when a black man is comfortable in his own skin and is is comfortable in his masculinity he's seen as a threat he's seen as dangerous he's seen as a thug he's not a thug that is a man being a man as he sees fit yeah. thank you tonight um so so before i even get into what i'm about to say one I, I am learning just like y'all, right? And I may fuck some shit up in my process of learning, just like anyone else who's trying to learn some things. But what I'm gonna try to do is work through tonight's question and then work my way back. But because what she's mentioning is, is makes me think about something that I've been struggling with for a long time. And I think that this class provided me the um, perfect opportunity to kind of tease out this, this, this tension that I, I've been grappling with. I'm gonna make a claim. And again, if, if it seems insensitive, if it seems, I apologize, but I'm, I'm working this out, okay? America in the West finds more comfort in a black man in a dress than just a regular masculine black man. America in the Western world feels more comfortable seeing a black man in a dress, makeup, nails painted, however you wanna take that, than seeing a masculine performing normal black man. I find it odd, right, that individuals, and again, this is no slight to them. This is no slight to them. I believe this is a byproduct of um, a lot of what we're discussing, right? I find it odd that individuals like Kid Cudi, Russell Westbrook, um, all these black men, right? Would you could even call homo, homo norm, uh, heteronormative, excuse me, right? They find this need to be liberated by putting on women's clothing. I find that odd, right? Um, I don't know how many of you, I'm gonna bring up Dave Chappelle, but not for why y'all think for another reason, right? Like I'm not going into that conversation with Dave Chappelle. Um, but so there was this movie, I believe, the movie is called Blue Streak. And it was Martin Lawrence and Dave Chappelle has a very small role in the movie, right? And in the movie, he tells a story on how they wanted him to put on a dress. And he's like, nah, I ain't, I ain't doing that shit, right? Um, and they were very adamant about him putting this dress on. And he just, he just refused to the point that Martin, right, who at the time is a larger superstar than Dave Chappelle, had to kind of come in and tell them to chill that shit out, right? 
So we'll use Martin as an example. For those who are familiar with the sitcom Martin, right? One of his more famous characters was who? Shanene, right? Um, Jamie Foxx. Before he was Jamie Foxx, the major superstar, he was on In Living Color. And one of his more famous characters was Wanda, right? So there's a history of having these black men put on dresses. Um, Richard Pryor talks about this as well, right? I ain't gotta go into Tyler Perry because y'all, his whole persona is based on him putting a dress on, right? So there's this, for me, I cannot escape this notion of America being comfortable with seeing a black man in a dress opposed to a black man just being a regular black man, right? And again, I, there may be some blinders in my perception of this. Um, there may be some insensitivity. And, and, and I do think this is a separate conversation from those who consider themselves cross-dressers, right? From those who identify as trans and they're going through a tr transition, right? That's a different conversation I'm having. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about men who identify themselves as men, who identify themselves as non-cross-dressing men, but having this desire and this need to put on a dress, right? So this is some of what, what Tanaya is talking about brings to my attention. Um, Roxana mentions, uh, she doesn't mention it, but what she's talking about is this notion of um, preventing what they call a black messiah, right? So there's a movie that recently came out talking about Fred Hampton, it's called Judas and the, and the Black Messiah, right? Where the title of that movie is pulled from, um, J. Edgar Hoover, who is the um, probably the worst white man in American history, in my opinion, right? Like this motherfucker, oh my God, if I could bring somebody up from the dead and shoot them, it would be him. Um, the reason being, every mass Black movement that was successful, he has had his hands in, in destroying it. From Marcus Garvey to the Black Panther movement, J. Edgar Hoover has had his hands in destroying these movements. In his Pro documents, right? The whole reason for COINTELPRO is to destroy or to prevent the rise of a black messiah. What is a messiah? Somebody tell me what a messiah is. Messiah, Where, have you, where else have you heard the term messiah? In the Bible. So why is Christ the messiah? I'm sorry, go ahead. Say it again tonight, I'll cut you off, I'm sorry. I don't have like an exact definition for Messiah. Um, all that I think about it, when I think of Messiah, I think of kind of like savior, yeah. savior from troubles or savior from turmoil. That's, that's exactly like going it. on within the land. Yeah, and, and um, Tulia put that in the, in the chat as well. So yes, savior, right? Leader is another way you can think about, but more so, I think more than um, leader, it would be savior, right? And they're almost interchangeable, but the fear really was a savior, right? So think about it, think about it. And this kind of goes back to this idea of anytime that you exhibit masculinity, they're gonna make sure that you get knocked down. Who could be considered a savior? Marcus Garvey, right? Tax evasion, he ends up um, dying in a jail cell, right? Through the hands of J. Edgar Hoover. Um, Mar Malcolm X. You know how his fate ended. Martin Luther King, you know how his fate ended, right? Uh, Huey P. Newton, you know how his fate ended. Fred Hampton, you know how his fate ended, right? So this idea of not, so another way you can think about it, right, is yes, it's stamping out the Messiah, but it's also eliminating the masculine, right? Because in the Western world, right, where masculinity is the power, then the individual who is more likely to subvert or challenge your authority will be the man, right? And, and to me, I think that's something that I, we as a people could use to our advantage by empowering women more, right? That's, that's a sidebar conversation. Um, I'm gonna kind of work through Autumn and then I'm gonna shut up. So Autumn brings up her, her experiences with her grandfather and her grandmother and the differences and the distinctions. Her grandfather being from the South, um, kind of socialized to be cautious, right, to be circumvent in the way that he moves, where your grandmother, not so much. So if you pay attention to what they call the Great Migration, when African people move either north from the south or they move west from the south, right? People who made up Cali, the black folks who made up California, and this is why I, I, I take great pride in being a black Californian. Nine times out of 10, 
these people were sent to California because they were not rocking with the racism in the South, right? They parents sent them because they felt that they would be harmed because they are not abiding by the norms of this region, right? Or they did something that said, fuck that shit, now I gotta go because I'm in, I'm, I'm in danger, right? So this is kind of makes up the population of the people of California, of the black folks in California, which is not a surprise why you have phenomena like gang culture coming out of California, phenomena like the Black Panther Party is coming out of California, because really you could argue the most rebellious and most um, revolutionary individuals in this um, United States hemisphere, right, migrated to California because they thought it was gonna be a more liberal place for them to be, right? Example, a quick story. Um, so before I came to Cal State LA to do my undergrad, um, I was at a HBCU in Tennessee called Lane College. Now, Lane College is in the middle of Jackson, Tennessee and Memphis, Tennessee. Very small town, um, very rural, right? So I'm coming from California. I got locks. I'm, uh, at the time, I'm Bubba Shanti Ra, so I would like wrap turbans on my head. Um, they didn't know what the fuck to do with me, right? But anyway, um, I, I just remember going through a gas station and there was this cat in front of me. I was with him and I'm talking to this other cat and the dude opens the door and puts his head down. Me, I'm like, bro, what the fuck are you doing? Because I'm in conversation, so I'm not really peeping the whole scene, right? And what happens is I'm like, that's, that's an odd way to open up the door for your homeboys, right? Like to, to why are you making yourself small just to open up the door? And when I, because I was in conversation, when I walked, I damn near ran into this white man, right? And he kind of looked at me like, bro, you out of place, what you doing? But I'm like, man, fuck you, you out of place, right? But everyone else who I'm around, you can see the fear on them. And you could, with the cut, cut the tension with the knife, you could feel the tension in the space because I violated a social norm within that space, right? But me from California, I'm like, man, fuck him. He ain't got no authority over me. Who is he to me, right? Because I don't have the understanding. I haven't been socialized to be cautious, to be fearful, right? In California, you have a little bit more leeway to express your masculinity, if you will, right? So a lot of um, how Autumn's articulating his, her grandfather's experiences brought me back to that moment because in the South, it's different. Like they, they have this thing in their psychology that does not allow them to move freely. Like they, that, that, that oppression, although it may not be tangible, right? But it's there and they very much feel it. You know what I mean? And I, and I think this is also how manhood is played out from a regional standpoint as well. Um, okay, so with, damn, we, damn, we out of town. Let me get just two more comments and we'll call it a day. Um, Louisa, what do you think about today's discussion or the reading? Luisa Mercedes Walters. Oh, it's Lucia, by the way. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay, it's okay. Um, it was really interesting, you know, like the dynamic of like um, how women and men, how souls is different, how, because um, I, what I took from it was that, um, uh, I would say that um, men and women have different types of, I guess, mindsets and when, being leaders in the household because you know like it also takes place in like cultural and also as well as um it could be culture and also upbringing like the way you were raised so I feel like those two are huge factors of how people view and perceive and how they could be in the household and how they could operate in the household thank you Lucia. uh Sulia Anasethi I hope I pronounced that right and please correct me if I didn't. Uh, what are your thoughts on our conversation or the readings today? Uh, you pronounced it right. Um, so what I thought about the reading is it just gave me a different perspective um, being Pacific Islander. I don't know, I don't really see these issues or I don't really look at like, you guys said, oh, the police, you guys look at them differently or you're like, I don't know how to explain it. It's just, it just, Bring me in a different perspective and how I need to consider um, just how I, how others view like their uh, systems and how like um, does that make sense? Yeah. Am I kind of making sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one part that uh, 
from the reading that I really liked was there was a uh, the quote where it talked about um, deduction maintains or uh, in many cases made black males the focus of its oppression and civil deductions maintains that if you destroy the head, you destroy the body. So I think many um, men were, they, their minds like not only like were their bodies being abused but they were like it's instilled in your guys's brains like it's psychology like so it's just it's it's sad to see how it's still going on today yeah um one, one thing i'll say actually, like i said um in regards to you know you feel as if your community doesn't really ha deal with a lot of these same issues which i would i would agree with by and large but one thing you could do is look at your proximity to whiteness right how close are you to whiteness and how far are you from whiteness? And that could determine how close you are into how the system of, of power will interact with you, right? So um, there's this, this euphemism that y'all may have heard of before or may not, and I'll, I'll make it real quick. Um, if you black, get back. If you brown, you down. If you yellow, you mellow. And if you white, you right. So if you white, you right. If you yellow, you mellow. If you brown, you down. If you black, get back, right? So what this speaks to is the hierarchical nature of racism. Right. And if you are to put racism on a totem pole by racial classifications, then it will go white, yellow, brown, or indigenous, right? Or you probably be somewhere in the middle of the yellow and the brown, Suleyana Sethi, and then black. Yeah, that's what I get confused on too. Is I don't know where Pacific Islanders stand because I don't associate myself with Asian Americans, right. but I see I don't associate myself with like, you know, Latinos mm -hmm. or but I do associate with them because like I don't know how to explain it. Like I, I don't. seem I, there's just like so many cultural like similarities, yeah. but differences. So I don't know where I, so I'm just, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I will say, what I will say, you may not have heard of this, but there is a strong connection between Africa and the Pacific Islands. Even the idea of surfing culture, that shit African. Nobody knows that, but the truth of the matter is surfing came out of Africa, right? And, and I know Pacific Islands have a very um, large island culture and surf culture, and that may be a connection that the, the world just hasn't really got privy to yet. Um, so I'm gonna show you what the reading is for next week and then we'll call it a day. I'm sorry for the, going over time today. Okay, so um, our next reading will be Black Boys Denied the Right to Be Men, or the, denied, excuse me, Denied the Right to Be Young. So that'll be our, our reading for next week. Um, I'll email that out to you by um, tomorrow or Friday, along with those extra credit opportunities. Um, is there any other last?